This is the story of a giant tree and a huge spider said to live in its shadow. The story unfolds in the biggest rainforest on the planet, the Amazon. The plants here pump out one-fifth of the world's oxygen. The Amazon River holds a fifth of all the world's fresh water. This place is an evolutionary powerhouse, generating literally millions of exotic species. This may be the most important environment on our planet. The giant of the Amazon is this tree, the Brazil nut. At 50 meters, it towers over the jungle. Its famous nut is a global business worth $50 million a year. But at the center of the tree's life is a mystery. If we can solve it, we may understand what drives the entire jungle ecosystem. The mystery is this. Why does this tree only produce its nut-filled pods in virgin rainforest? If you damage the forest, the tree shuts down. This makes the Amazon a very valuable place and keeps loggers at bay. Twenty-first century science is trying to understand the connection between this tree and the forest around it. But it's not only big science coming here to solve major mysteries. Martin Nicholas is an amateur. His day job is selling water treatment systems, but in his spare time, he's a tropical spider expert. He's on a quest to find a brand new species of spider in the Brazil nut tree's world. This is Puro Maldonado, and it's, um, it's got a real frontier town feel to it. The, uh, the town itself is built on, on golden logging money. Um, and it sits at the confluence between two of the great tributaries of the Amazon, uh, the Amazon River. The Tamapada goes that way, the Madras Dias goes that way, and basically we're sitting right in the middle of primary rainforest, just with this town sitting in the middle of it. The Amazon has always been a dangerous place for explorers. One of the real hazards of working in an environment like this is the diseases that, uh, that you do find in this area. Um, our friend Artemio there, he has a, an appalling wasting condition called leishmaniasis. causes huge scars. It can affect any part of your body at all. It is treatable in almost every case, although it can be fatal in extreme cases. Um, we're told that um, he got it somewhere up the Tambopada River, and uh, guess where we're going? Martin's journey was inspired by a letter from a friend in Peru. I was talking to a farmer who tells me that he loses many of his chickens that live around his farm and that of his brother. I ask if snakes or dogs are the predator, but he tells me it is the araña polita, chicken spider, I think. He imagines the scene constantly. This so-called chicken-eating spider is said to have legs as thick as a man's fingers. Martin's convinced he's looking for an unrecorded species of tarantula. There are over 800 known kinds of tarantula and none of them eat chickens.
The idea of a spider that drags chickens round the backyards of Peru may sound absurd, but it's enough to drag an enthusiast like Martin halfway across the globe. My gut reaction when I first got that letter was immediately, I've got to go out and find it. I've got to go out and have a look. I've got to find the monster. Martin's quest is taking him deep into the Amazon, the largest piece of forest on Earth. 85% of it hasn't been explored yet. There may be tribes of indigenous people here who have no idea that a world exists outside their forest. This is still a lost world. While Martin's quest will take a lot of old-fashioned footwork, understanding how the Brazil nut tree works involves a new kind of high-tech jungle science. This is Barro Colorado Island in Panama, headquarters of the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. It's a high-tech outdoors laboratory. Scientists here use all the latest gizmos to discover how different animals and plants live their lives. This is probably within the last half hour to an hour or so, it's getting really, really active. as if the ocelot's taken a short rest immediately after the beauty line's gone flat. The experts discovered that the jungle is so complex it can only be understood by looking at it over tens or even hundreds of years. So they started keeping small sections of rainforest under constant surveillance all over the world. Nothing grows. Nothing dies without it being recorded. Their data allows us to see years pass in seconds. Huge changes are compressed into mere moments. To understand how a Brazil nut tree works, you need to look at its entire lifespan. This tree's life began 500 years ago as a nut inside a rock-hard pod, just like this. When it drops, it can kill. It's the weight of a cannonball and accelerates to 80 kilometers an hour in just three seconds. The pod falling season can be a deadly lottery for the forest's animals. Pod is a conundrum. There's nothing in the Amazon with jaws strong enough to crush it and release the seeds. This is the first problem in unraveling the tree's story. It's led scientists in Peru to create an ingenious experiment. It takes 20 minutes to saw open a pod. A magnet is glued to each tagged nut and the whole pod's put back together again. These trick pods are then scattered around the forest. They attract the solution to the problem. 
The pod isn't opened by an animal with huge jaws at all, but a small rodent called the agouti, with teeth like chisels. Amazingly, the Brazil nut tree depends entirely on this one species to release its seeds. The agouti buries the nuts it doesn't eat, a future snack. But they often forget where they've hidden them. The forgotten nuts germinate into tiny trees. By tracking the nuts with a metal detector, the experts found that the agoutis bury them in shade, often near the mother tree. And most kind of seedlings die without strong, direct sunlight. But Brazil nut seedlings have a special ability. In shady places, they can go dormant for decades. The sapling of today's giant tree would have waited for something to change in the environment above. Martin Nicholas is heading into the world of the Brazil nut trees and he's following the best advice for travellers. Always ask the locals. Arturo, my guide, knows of this little farm um, on the banks of the river that sounds exactly like the, uh, the one mentioned in, uh, in the letter that I got. So we're here to uh, check it out, see if they know anything about these big black spiders and uh, do a head count of the chickens as well. Wow. Yes. Wow. That's, a that's a big spider. That's uh, that's almost a foot across. <laughs> Does he think that the big tarantula will be able to catch, so one of the small chickens? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. could. Yeah. You think it could happen? Yeah. yeah. Anything's possible. This is exactly the story that we've heard. This is, this is the tale that is now starting to reoccur. A story from the letter, and we're obviously, definitely, in the right sort of place. Martin heads deep into the forest to look for the spider. Here's a spider. Down here we have a, a satanid spider, or wandering spider. This one's quite a small one, um, and it's holding its egg sac in its jaws. Um, obviously this is the, uh, the breeding season. A bite from a spider of this sort of size probably wouldn't hurt, if indeed she could actually get her jaws through you in the first place. The trick with most spiders in the world is that they cannot get their jaws wide enough open. It's rather like us trying to bite into a beach ball. We can't, we can't get our mouth open wide enough. And it's the same thing with spiders. It's only the, the biggest spiders and the ones with the most powerful jaws that can actually get their jaws wide enough to penetrate our skin and their jaws long enough to get through our skin. And then of those, very, very few have venom toxic enough to cause us any, any problem at all. I don't think this little spider here would be considered dangerous at all. This forest hasn't always been wild and untamed. Indigenous people once treated it like a kind of garden. They planted Brazil nut trees in groves to make harvesting easier for their descendants. But 500 years ago, when our giant tree was just a dormant sapling, something extraordinary and violent happened here. It's incredible to think that these gigantic Brazil nut trees 500 years ago were just simply tiny little saplings, but that they were to witness the most vicious and bloodthirsty war that this forest had ever seen. 
before and probably since. In 1532, Spanish conquistadors arrived. They came here for one reason, they came here for gold. Unfortunately, the conquistadors thought that the indigenous people were subhuman. They would torture them to death just for the amusement of it. They deliberately spread diseases. They killed them in their thousands, in their millions, actually. The indigenous people were forced to fight for their very existence. And in the end, they were devastated. Literally tens of millions died. But ironically, the conquistadors may have breathed a spark of life into our dormant Brazil nut sapling when they brought steel to the forest. For the first time, the Amazon's great trees could be felled in minutes, rapidly creating great holes in the canopy above. An event like this may have finally bathed our Brazil nut seedling in precious sunlight. Every fallen tree leaves a light gap. As we see it, a gap looks unremarkable, but to realize its full importance, we must speed up time. Now the clearing explodes into life. All kinds of plants join a race to keep ahead of each other and avoid being left in the shade. Hungry animals exploit the fresh growth. The Brazil nut sapling awakes. The tree grows into an unmistakable hallmark of the Amazon horizon. Over the centuries, the Brazil nut becomes the centre of a vast web of life. And scientists have come up with some ingenious ways of finding out what's in it. A spray gun fires insecticide up into the canopy. It knocks out insects and they tumble back to earth. But which specific tree did the different insects fall from? It's a tough question. Time for a new idea. A hot air blimp carries a lightweight raft, which scientists ride on. Up here, they can pick out which trees they want to investigate. 
the raft is dropped right on top. It used to be thought there were about three million species of plants and animals on Earth. But work like this made us revise the figure upwards to 20, 30 or even 50 million. A single tree like the Brazil nut can hold thousands of different species. And this life isn't a random jumble. These creatures form a web of relationships. The tree's wilting flowers are not wasted. These are leafcutter ants. A single colony can hold 10 million hungry individuals. So the seasonal shower of petals is a valuable bonus. Where there are ants, there are, of course, ant eaters. The giant ant eater has no teeth. It slops up its prey with a tongue over half a metre long. There are other ants here, and they are much more frightening. Whoa. They say it's not the big things in the forest that get you. It's not the jaguars or the lions or the tigers. It's the little things, like the mosquitoes and the sand flies. And these are two of the biggest small things that get you. They're called bullet ants because the sting is reputed to feel very much like being shot. Scary looking things, aren't they? I know of a couple of people who've been stung by the bullet ant, and they say the pain is rather like, initially, rather like having a large cigar extinguished on your skin. Incredible burning sensation. There are some tribes in the Amazon that use bullet ants in their initiation ceremonies for their young men. The bullet ant's sting is the most painful of any insect. The Satari Maui knock out 200 to use in a manhood test. Their woven sting inwards into a glove. When they come to, they're very angry. Teenage boys must wear this for 10 minutes while the ants inject their potent nerve toxin. The test is to show no sign of pain. Their arms are paralyzed and tremble uncontrollably for days. I'm not going to put my finger anywhere near these. I'm not being a wuss. It's just I don't want to be out for 24 hours. <laughs> Martin's quest has brought him into the territory of the Amazon's big cat, the jaguar. He too will find food in the shadow of the Brazil nut tree. A deer perhaps, or a sloth. It's appropriately named.
The sloth had just enough of a head start. It's escaped the jungle's greatest ground predator, but it's climbing towards something even more fearsome. The Brazil nut tree is home to the harpy eagle, the biggest bird of prey on the planet. Some of the Brazil nut's web of life becomes active at night. Martin's looking for the chicken eater. But there are other spiders here that even a spider enthusiast must be wary of. <laughs> okay. Well, it's not every day you see the most deadly spider in the world. That's what we have here. This is a wandering spider. The reason it's so dangerous to us is, first of all, it's extremely toxic. The venom of this spider is around 18 times more deadly than that of the Black Widow. It has extremely large fangs. It can get through our skin extremely quickly. Thirdly, it's exceptionally aggressive. Just a slight tap on one of its legs immediately provokes a response. These things jump and bite. They don't just bite. Before an antivenom was developed, up to a thousand people a year were dying of this spider in Brazil alone. It's one of those spiders that you don't want to take your eyes off for very long. Nothing on this earth would make me touch this spider. Let's leave him in peace. In the jungle, the safest place is tucked up in your hammock. Right, and apart from the dawn chorus of monkeys this morning, it's not a bad night's sleep actually. They know I'm talking about them. They're just proving a point now. It's not funny. Show some respect for people sleeping. Even by day, the Amazon holds unexpected horrors. As a veteran traveler, Martin knows you must keep your most sensitive body parts out of water because of a fish called the kangaroo. It swims towards urine, burrows into the source, and then sticks fast with backward-facing barbs. The only solution is to cut it out with a sharp knife. By day, tarantulas hide in burrows under big trees. If Martin can find a likely hole, then he's all set to unleash some homemade technology. Ah, now that's more like it. Base of a tree. And there's a big hole down there. It's dry. <clears throat> it's a nice smooth shape. It's away from any water, shielded by the tree itself. Under normal circumstances, we'd have to uh, we'd have to wait until night, um, but we've got a way of doing a sneak preview. Tarantula cam. Years in development and literally pounds spent. Tarantula cam involves a little security camera, five little LED lights on the top there, and the pièce de résistance, the tricycle. 
for manoeuvring round tight corners. All systems go. Is Tarantula Cam about to meet a monster? Goes back quite a way. Oh my god! There's something looking at me. <laughs> it's it's a possum or a mouse. <laughs> it's, it's it's checking me out. I'm sorry, mate. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> So no tarantulas, unless they're very, very odd bedfellows then, anyway. I'm chuffed with that. At least the camera works. The camera works a treat. Who knows what will be down the next hole. It's fantastic. <laughs> One of the challenges of exploring the rainforest is that it isn't called that for nothing. Giant trees like the Brazil nut generate their own local climate. They release moisture, which forms clouds, and they produce rain. Rain falls here at least 200 days a year. This can last for minutes, it can last for hours, it can last all day. Just got to go with it. Trees soak up half the water and the rest escapes to feed the great river. There's a direct link between life and rain because the more it rains, the more diversity of life a forest holds. The Amazon forest creates some of the biggest storms on the planet. Up to three meters of rain falls here each year. Sometimes it rains so hard that it floods over 350,000 square kilometers of forest. This flooded world is a strange submarine landscape. The forest floor may be 10 meters underwater, so terrestrial animals become aquatic. While mammals go into the water, the fish try to leave it. The hatchet fish leaps to avoid predators. The arowana leaps for spiders.
the flood lasts for six months. The Brazil nut tree flourishes on higher ground, but its old empty pods trap their own mini flood, and this attracts a strange web of life found nowhere else on Earth. A poison dart frog carries a tadpole on its back. It's been scouring the forest for one of these pods. A mosquito has laid its eggs in here already. In the race to grow up, the larvae turn cannibalistic. But they'll never make it out of here. The tadpole is a predator. But the tadpole's not safe either. There's another predator in this cavern, a damselfly larva. It's not a great predator, but then it doesn't need to be. The tadpole's trapped. of species that make up the web of life around a Brazil nut tree. Could just one hold the key to the tree's mystery? Why it will only bear fruit in virgin forest? Insect expert David Rubick suspects bees because they pollinate big trees. But they don't always welcome close investigation. Looking up a massive strangler fig and a massive stingless bee nest. One of the aggressive ones. Right now there are bees raining out of the uh, nest and cascading down here and finding me and laying into me wherever they get a grip. If you're not a little disciplined, you, you tend to lose it and <laughs> the pain kicks in, the smell, the uh, continual squeaking and then the sticky resin that they're starting to put on me now. Ouch. I can say that's truly an effective defense. And if I were unprotected, they'd be all over my head primarily, and this would be too much. I'd run. I'd run as fast as I could. <laughs> Ouch. Look at that. If I try and brush them off, they're stuck on with resin. They're holding on with their mandibles. And they're not breaking the skin, but they're coming close. Time to go. David climbs 40 metres to the tree's canopy to find the bees that pollinate its flowers. The flowers are out at the end of very thin branches, but bees are strongly attracted by smell, and David's brought a special chemical with him that he hopes will act like a bee magnet. Out. Bees are on their way. There's nothing to do but wait. They've just shown up now. One big one, one little blue one. These bees pollinate the tree's flowers, and only then will they produce the giant pods.
The bees travel around the forest. David follows them. Maybe the solution to the tree's mystery lies at the other end of their journey. They leave the Brazil nut tree's own patch of forest way behind. Over a kilometre away, David finds the same kind of bees flying around a rare, fragrant orchid. Ah, great. Some luck. Uh, fallen branch on the tree. That's one of our orchids. Uh, the kind of the orchid bee would love. Bees are maybe, a, it's been estimated, a million times more sensitive to the kinds of fragrances like orchid flower than we are. They're, they are known to pick these things up and fly it from over a kilometer away. What's going on here? David has discovered that a male bee can't get a mate unless he's wearing a particular scent. And he has to steal that scent from these orchids. So if the forest is cut down and the orchids are destroyed, then the bees won't be able to mate. No reproduction means no new bees, which means the Brazil nut flowers won't be pollinated, which means the pods won't grow. So eventually the lucrative Brazil nut tree itself will vanish. That's why the Brazil nut tree needs intact forest to survive. Webs of life surround every tree across the Amazon. The rainforest is a vast biological machine, and small, fragile relationships hold the whole thing together, like rivets. Understanding the Brazil nut tree has required a time warp. This accelerated view of life can now reveal the Amazon's most sinister secret. The Brazil nut tree lives for 500 years. It's a survivor, almost invulnerable. Yet there is one creature in these forests big enough to kill it. A seed in an animal's dropping germinates on one of its branches. The tiny plant sends out roots, long roots. Finally, they anchor in the ground. Then they grow and begin to wrap around the tree for support. This is the strangler fig. The roots take a suffocating grip on their victim. The living part of a tree's trunk is just under the bark. It's only a few millimetres thick, but it carries all the tree's water and nutrients. The strangler squeezes tight and chokes the tree. It's a death that takes years. Eventually, the dead tree starts to disintegrate, leaving a hollow shell standing in its place the adult strangler fig tree. Our Amazon journey has one more secret to give up. Does the chicken-eating spider really exist? We've looked at many burrows without uh, a great deal of success. Uh, they've either been empty or they've had... Um, or they've had various mammals down them. Um, we've come across a very promising burrow just here at the roots of this Brazil nut tree. Um, it's nice and shallow, classic shape, 
nice and oval shape. So we're gonna send the tarantula cam down and see what, uh, see what lives down the bottom. the camera. <laughs> that looks like a juvenile. Um, that's not an adult spider. Excuse me, mate. Just coming by. There's another one. Holy moly. Are you seeing this? Are you seeing this? I think mummy's home as well. I'm very aware about where my hands are just now because, look, whoa! There is a giant black spider hanging onto my camera. <laughs> in many ways, this ties in very much with what the locals were telling us about. Um, it's, it's big, it's black, it's long, strong, thick set legs. It's a powerful, um, a powerful theraphosid, tarantula spider. This, this is our chicken spider. We found it. underneath her fangs there. Whoa! She's got two very large downward pointing fangs and tarantulas stab downwards. True spiders jaws work like pincers. The legs come up into the air and the jaws come out and they strike downwards like that. And that's how she catches her prey as well. There we go. The spiderlings that we saw at the beginning were well grown on. They were, a pro well, it's a little bit difficult to sell, but they were at least two or three inches across. Now for spiderlings of that size to still be living with the mother is extraordinary. It, it doesn't happen. Tarantulas aren't gregarious whatsoever because, of course, more spiders in the same burrow um, at the same time, creates competition for food, creates competition for space, and of course there's an issue when the mother spider is, is ready to breed again. But there she is, in all her glory. <laughs> Martin will return at night, when he hopes the spider will come out of its hole to hunt. He may be able to study it more closely by picking it up. Spider. It's something brand new. It doesn't correspond with any of the other species that we know of in this area or any of the adjoining areas. 
It's surprising in a world where it's so easy to travel around, there are still animals of this sort of size and reputation that still remain unclassified. The great blank spaces in the map are not yet all filled in. The species has not yet been described. This is something brand new. The jungle is a place of infinite complexity. Science is only beginning to understand it. Here, life is at its most abundant, yet the connections can be desperately fragile. The jungle is a labyrinth, always throwing up new mysteries to unravel, new avenues to explore. Who knows what secrets remain deep in the Amazon?